Recently, the Secretary of Academics Board, South Asian Medical Student Association, being an enthusiast, an excellent academician, and successful in other field works, we are privileged to have him among us. Stay tuned with us and keep sharing your queries and doubts in the chat box. Now, I would like to request Sridhar Das to take over with the following proceedings. Thank you. Over to you, Sridhar Das. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Thank you for the uh, Thank you, PTS, uh, for this uh, occasion. So, uh, before I like to start um, at the audio session. Okay, one second. Okay, so um, before like uh, I'll start off, I'll just say uh, that uh, um, we actually have started with uh, we I personally started with pharmacology um, in my second year, and uh, one thing which I have noticed down the years in pharmacology was that we have lacked an integration. So uh, whether it be the integration with anatomy or biochem or other basic subjects we have actually lacked it as far as we go but after that uh, currently when i'm like uh, in the final year and i'm studying medicine i have understood one fact that uh, due to this uh, lack of attention there has been a sense of problem in basically understanding the drugs so we as medicals uh, we will be facing a problem in understanding or rather memorizing which drug to give when but uh, rather the main problem that we'll focus upon is uh, to diagnose and then predict which particular drug to, is to be given. So like uh, there will be representatives always who will be there to introduce you to the drugs and the new drugs which come to the market and how they are beneficial or what are their adversities. But what you won't be able to understand once you pass out of your graduation is basically the exact diagnosis and how to understand the link between the anatomy and the pharmacology. So I would like to like uh, start off from a very basic viewpoint about what exactly the uh, nervous system is and then we can uh, dive right into the exact concepts. And so like uh, we'll be starting from a very pretty basic point. So I'll just start uh, presenting my screen and uh one sec yeah uh, so is it visible to everyone yeah it's visible enough yeah so uh, before like uh, I start off, um, I would like to welcome everyone to this session. So instead of being a very um, educational type of session, I would like to also introduce to you to exactly in the clinics and also include some points of anatomy and physiology into this lecture. So unlike what you study, uh, what we actually study in our colleges. Uh, a pretty basic pharmacology lecture. This is going to be something different in the fact that we'll be including various parts of anatomy as well. So without, uh, like, I'll just uh, clarify this point once. I have tried to explain each and everything in a very clear format so that you actually understand all the points very specifically. So in spite of that, if there is any doubt, we will try to have a question answer session after this. And in, in case uh, the time runs out, uh, I'll also share my email so that I can put, like answer your questions and queries accordingly. So without wasting much time, I'll just start off. So uh, the first question um, to be asked is, how is your adrenergic system wired? So 
the first question is is it dependent only on the adrenaline and noradrenaline and how does the body know when to activate the sympathetic drives and what is the basis of this entire system so before we start off learning the pharmacology we'll have to understand why this particular anatomy comes into being why actually we require an adrenergic system and then we can go to the defects and how to cure it so i would like to ask if anybody answer like answer volunteer and answer uh, any one of the questions like um, at least the first one i guess uh, can be answered by you guys about is it dependent only on the adrenaline and not that and also the next question is it only activated during the fright flight stimuli as we know or is it activated even during the rest so can anyone like uh, if you can maybe uh, unmute the mics and uh, answer the question okay uh, so i'll maybe move forward with the questions so am i audible to everyone yes yes absolutely yeah yeah okay fine uh, okay fine so uh, the point to understand out here is uh, how is the adrenergic system wired so yes uh, so this is one of the very important question so uh, these are the three basic questions that we'll be targeting first before we dive right into the topic so first of all the nervous system is uh, like a composed of the cns and the pns as we all know the peripheral nervous system is again divided into the autonomic and the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system is again divided into three parts sympathetic the parasympathetic and the lesser known enteric system so the part which we are dealing with is basically the sympathetic system so there's a reason why i have written two out here and one out here and there is uh, like we'll understand as the session progresses why exactly this the division actually exists so basically the nervous system unit is a particular unit that composes of like uh, that together the entire nervous system so as you can see the autonomic system has a particular ganglion in the middle and there are two nerve cells so let's consider this to be two limbs so the ganglion gives out two limbs one is the pre ganglionic neuron and one is the post ganglionic neuron as compared to that of the somatic nervous system that there, that there is only one link so there goes the two and the one so the autonomic nervous system whenever you find it will have whether it be like any kind of autonomic nervous system usually has this particular arrangement so then we go to the sympathetic nervous system so the sympathetic nervous system is one very important concept that we need to understand uh, from a very basic age of uh, just 7 or 8 i guess so uh, it was like uh, when i was introduced to the concept of sympathetic nervous system first the first question that stuck uh, to my mind is whether it is only associated with So these are the three things that very commonly talked about. But one thing we miss. Okay. Is it working, sir? Yes, it's working. Okay. Yeah. So continuing with it. so the sympathetic nervous system uh, basically as we know it is associated with flight fight and flight so uh, we must also know one very less taught topic is basically it is also active at rest so all your sweat glands are basically given innervation by the sympathetic nervous system and when we talk about the anatomy of it it basically consists of the thoracolumbar outflow from the spinal cord which is basically the t1 to l3 segment 
so without going much deep into what exactly that is let's actually focus upon the topic and understand this particular point so they have preganglionic and postganglionic fibers so the ganglion is a term that we need to focus upon but the question remains what is a ganglion so uh, if anybody of you could actually define ganglion it would be great so that uh, like i could understand that this more of an intuition so uh, everybody please go ahead and what is ganglion gang hello sir uh, ganglion is a collection of cell body outside the cns yeah that is a pretty much complete answer and uh, it is a type of neuron cell body in the central nervous system outside the central nervous system as you said yeah so like uh, when we talk about and you is interesting ganglion that we talk about in this synthetic nerve so it's very important okay so uh, the sympathetic chain ganglia is uh, one structure that we understand from like we have taught from a very basic point in the anatomy but unlikely we uh, like this is a very uh, difficult concept to understand so um, to be very simple about it it's a ventral it's located ventrally and laterally to the spinal cord as you can see this is a chain of ganglion and this has various units attached to it so it's located ventrally and laterally to the spinal cord and extends from the upper neck down to the coccyx so when we talk about the sympathetic ganglion is basically uh, you understand uh, by it uh, as a nerve unit so the sympathetic chain ganglion for example this is one of the vertebral sympathetic chain ganglion so what it happens is that when the motor fibers leave the ventral horn of the spinal cord it basically goes through the white ramus communicans in the sympathetic ganglion so the sympathetic chain ganglion is basically the point of junction through which the new nerve fibers after the synapse go through the gray ramus communicans into the post ganglion into the post ganglionic sympathetic fibers so basically this is a mixed spinal nerve as you can see so there is a sensory compartment but now we are compo- like we are talking about the motor fibers only so the motor fibers as you can see they are coming down and they are communicating with this particular ganglia so as you said that this is basically a collection of cell body so accordingly according to the position of the nerve with respect to this particular ganglia we can have four types of nerves so one is basically when the synapse occurs at the same level and the post ganglionic fibers also occur at the same level so this is one example which we find in the skin and the next one is that it ascends to different level so after doing the synapse the nerve does not remain confined to that particular system rather it rises up and supplies a different part so this is a very good example of the head neck and lower abdomen the next very important example is the post ganglionic splanchnic which is basically the post ganglionic nerve runs separately so it is actually called splanchnic so the splanchnic means that it's not going through the spinal nerve and it has its own origin and own root and the final one is the pre ganglionic splanchnic which rather bypasses the entire system it bypasses the entire ganglion and completely to the, uh, and goes completely down to synapse in a different part so it synapses in a different ganglion which is located close to the organ so why are we even talking about this sympathetic chain ganglia so the answer lies in the peripheral ganglia so one of the very important ganglia which like we understood that this particular part 
which is bypassing ganglion completely to the synapse in the peripheral ganglion that the type 4 nerves basically forms a peripheral ganglion so the peripheral ganglion can be celiac ganglion the superior mesenteric the inferior mesenteric and the aortic or renal ganglion so basically what it does is instead of having a root in this parasympathetic paravertebral chain of ganglia it basically has a ganglion located very close to an organ so so it's actually related to the celiac plexus celiac trunk and that is why it has the celiac ganglion the superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric and aortic organ so i have put a question mark upon the largest ganglion of the ans because we understand celiac ganglion as a larger ganglion of ans so why are we basically studying this part the answer lies that the adrenal gland is very much related to this concept so when we talk about the adrenal gland and the adrenergic medulla we basically think it to be a separate part from the sympathetic system and so when we talk about adrenergic system i've seen many people confuse it whether they are part of a sympathetic system how are they basically related to the sympathetic system so we all know like injecting adrenal or adrenal gives us a very high drive so it increases your metabolism it increases your heart rate it increases the sympathetic drive that's true but this is how exactly how anatomically the adrenergic system is located and connected to the sympathetic system so the preganglionic fibers directly innervate it so just like we saw in the type 4 there is no ganglia which is located near to the vertebra rather there is a preganglionic fiber that runs down to this particular organ in the adrenal medulla and then it di directly comes in contact with a synapse so that particular synapse or that particular connection is basically with the chromaffin cells so the chromaffin cells are getting innervated by the preganglionic fibers of the sympathetic system and they are releasing their neurotransmitters so on so forth so adrenergic medulla is a home for the ganglion in itself and you can see the histology is basically a composite ganglion cell which is collected together to form the medulla so that is why the adrenergic system is composed like it's a part of the sympathetic nervous system so if anybody asks you from the next time why are you saying that adrenergic system is a part of this entire sympathetic nervous system you must answer not because adrenal once injected in the body gives you a sympathetic drive but rather uh, try to answer it as because it's a basic unit it's a composition composite unit where the sympathetic preganglionic fibers come down and they synapse so over to the next part is the cholinergics and the preganglionics so this is a very basic diagram that we study from the very first of the pharmacology sessions so the cholinergics and the preganglionics are very much linked so all preganglionic fibers have acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter so as you can see like you can basically compare the system the sympathetic system with the adrenal medulla so instead of this ganglion it's just the organ and instead of another nerve passing it's just the medulla secreting hormones into the bloodstream so it's basically similar and it also releases the same hormones but the thing about this is to understand that the first question which i asked in the session was whether this entire system is only linked to adrenaline and non adrenaline so the answer is of course it's also related to the ach so if there is any error in the ach your sympathetic drive is bound to go awry. So in that case, this entire thing should be composite in order for the system to work. And then we come to the holy grail, the adrenergic transmission. So the adrenergic transmission basically deals with the neurotransmitter called noradrenaline. So basically there are six steps when we talk about the transmission. First, there is the synthesis of catecholamines. Then the storage of dopamine, the release of the noradrenaline, the noradrenaline binding to the adrenoceptors, the neuronal uptake, and the metabolism. So, so when I first like I took up this session, I understood a very common doubt, which is very prevalent among the medicos, uh, especially when the second year uh, is ongoing, 
is regarding which receptors are present where and exactly what the transmission is so at least one system one thing and also the another thing is that why is adrenergic system considered to a part to be a part of the sympathetic nervous system so i guess the first doubt which was why it is a part of the sympathetic nervous system is clear but the next part about the transmission is to be dealt with now so the first part of this entire transmission is basically the synthesis so like uh, this is the cycle i won't go into the exact depths of it but let's focus on this three points so first is the active transport of the tyrosine in the cytosol then the tyrosine is compared come uh, like uh, converted into the dopa by the tyroxine hydroxylase tyrosine hydroxylase and finally into the dopamine so so you can see out here this is possibly what is basically happening so there is the na plus and the tyrosine which gets inside it's active transmit active uptake and after that it's converted into dopa and dopamine and of course it has to be stored and then released and once it's released it goes in and binds to a particular receptor or it goes binds to the same receptor like on the presynaptic receptor which is of course the alpha 2 which we'll later discuss or it can be metabolized or it can be metabolized it goes to the urine and the third major thing is that it can be uptaken as well so once we talk about the synthesis of uh this catecholamines we actually focus on this particular drug so this particular drug is very important because it's used clinically for treating a condition of pheochromocytoma uh the exact manifestations of pheochromocytoma to discuss will be beyond the uh, basic meat beyond this uh, purview of the meat but what it does basically it inhibits this step so the tyrox uh, tyrosine hydroxylase is inhibited and so the dopamine formation is inhibited and the next few steps are also inhibited and thus the adrenergic system transmission is not occurring so next step is the storage so when we talk about the storage of dopamine so uh, it's basically like thinking that um uh, like it's a uh, for example let's have an example of you earning money so once you start earning money you'll get a constant source of money so you need to have a particular storage for it as well it's not like that you're taking up money and you're spending it simultaneously so in that case you won't have excess like storage to deal with conditions when you need it so but you spend a little bit of money on daily basis so for example when you're doing your internship you're getting a constant source of money and you're also spending it on treats on giving uh, treats to friends or maybe other expenses that you would have liked to done beforehand but there is also a huge amount of storage that you need to do so similarly the body is also shaped in the similar manner that is that in spite of the dopamine became like uh, it's becoming stored inside this vesicles but still a certain amount of dopamine is always like a certain amount of dopamine is converted into the norepinephrine and the norepinephrine is always secreted so a certain amount of norepinephrine is always given out from the presynapse into the postsynapse so the basic role of this particular slow and steady maintenance is very important when it comes to thermoregulation so the sweat glands that you actually have in your body are working continuously whenever the temperature is rising high so this particular drive is also responsible for it so there is a constant supply of norepinephrine but there is also the storage and the storage is what is basically occurring in the vesicles of the nerve terminals so the storage is occurring as well as there is a transport like there is the formation of norepinephrine so the uh, dopamine is converted into the norepinephrine by dopamine hydroxylase and here comes the role of a very important medicine that is the rezepine so the rezepine is one of the medicine that we actually have also seen very much used in the case of ayurveda as well but uh, like what we see in the clinics is basically the overuse of rezepine is linked to some psychiatric disorders as well so uh, like let's not go into the exact clinical manifestations 
but what it actually does out here. So it basically blocks this VMAT. So VMAT is vesicular monoamine transporting. So once it blocks, there's no storage. So once there's no storage, there is no chance of the secretion, like of the release, once there is a stimuli. So as you know, like as I was saying, that there is a constant release, but there is also a constant storage because whenever you need it, like for example, you have a minimum amount of constant sweating. So there is a constant supply of norepinephrine releasing from the presynapse. But if there is a huge amount of sympathetic stimuli, for example, a car comes, uh, like you're crossing the road and a car suddenly comes. So you have enough stores. So once you have enough stores in your particular vesicles, you can think about safety. So that is the role of storing. And resipine actually prevents one of the steps. That is basically the conversion. The next step is basically the release, the release of norepinephrine or noradrenaline. So the release is pretty simple. It's basically the receptor going and binding. So these both are membranes, and these membranes can easily fuse together. So once they fuse together, they release all what is contained inside into the pre uh, in the into the presynapses from the presynapse, and then it can go to the prosynapse. Postsynapse is basically where the receptors are located. So before we go into the exact depths of understanding what receptors it's targeting, we need to understand the exact release mechanism. So the vesicles fuse to the presynapse and pour in the norepinephrine. But like when you are actually having an excessive sympathetic drive, so one very important condition that we find in our clinics is the ventricular fibrillation. So in the ventricular fibrillation, what happens is that the heart is beating at a very high pace. So to simply speak about it, you need to control it. You need to have a negative effect so that it can reduce its rate and also maintain its rate beat. So you can go for a DCO cardio version, which is actually what you call as shocking uh, as well as you can give the birth rhythm. So this is one of the very important drugs in the emergency clinics, whereby you prevent the release of NA and thereby you decrease the sympathetic drive. And that is where you can, you, uh, you can use it for controlling the VFIP. And there is also like other sympathetic myometics, which promotes the release of norepinephrine. So there is tyramine and ephedrine and amphetamine. So this amphetamine is a very important drug, at least um, not uh, if not in India, it's very potent uh, in the states. So uh, it's very potent uh, whereby like it's a very commonly abused drug in the college students. So what it basically does is that the, for example, if you uh, like um, the exact scenario is somewhat traceable like this, for example, if you have to complete an entire book of syllabus in one day. So in that case, you need a huge amount of sympathetic drive that prevents you from sleeping. And that is where the amphetamine abuse comes into play. So the drug MDMA is also linked to this, where you get a huge amount of sympathetic drive and you can get a clear mind to complete the examination. So the late night study can be actually given by amphetamine. But however, there are a huge amount you can understand excessive amphetamine, like even beyond a particular limit can land you up in the same condition of research. And then there can be jeopardy of your particular heart rhythms. And that's why it's very dangerous. Finally, we come to the norepinephrine binding to the adrenoceptors. So we'll be dealing with it in details. Before that, we'll go for the neuronal uptake. So the neuronal uptake is a very important topic, specifically uh, from the purview of the tricyclic antidepressants. So uh, today is World Mental Health Day, as you might have known. So uh, you might have understood that the advent of tricyclic antidepressant is a very major progress of mankind. So it's basically like the um, the mechanism was actually understood after the discovery of the drug. But still, we could understand and we could initiate the development of further drugs. 
So the TCAs are a very important group of drugs. Now we actually come to the neuronal uptake, whereby there is another very important drug, the cocaine. So the cocaine is basically like a very importantly, um, very important in the current scenario, the cocaine, and what basically it is, is its physical manifestation. And rather more important is the pharmacology behind it. So most of the released norepinephrine is taken back into the presynapse and the adrenergic nerve terminals, which are stored in the vesicles and metabolites. So you can see out here. So yeah, in this figure, you can see that the neuron takes back whatever it has re released. So it's like you spend your money, but you think that, no, I have spent too much on my clothes this time. Maybe I'll save a bit. So even after you release your money, you take back a little bit. Similarly, the nurse always wants to, like every system in our body is trying to conserve energy. So in that case, it is also uptaking the same, the same neurotransmitter it is released. So similarly, there is the new uptake. So this uptake is actually decreasing the total concentration of the neurotransmitter in this state. So the total amount of neurotransmitter that is responsible for providing an intensity of the effect is reduced because it's taking up. But what cocaine does is basically it blocks the uptake. So how it blocks is basically by blocking the dopamine transporter. And so the uptake of this neurotransmitter norepinephrine is prevented and thereby increasing the concentration in this nerve state. And due to the excess amount of that, it basically turns from a first order reaction kinetics to a zero order and huge amount of norepinephrine is present and thereby the intensity of effect is produced. So in normal condition, what happens is basically the body understands that yes, this particular nerve terminus won't require huge amount of norepinephrine. So let's take up why waste it, why waste it and why create an excessive synthetic drive. So let's take it up. But what will ha what happens when you take cocaine is basically it inhibits this. And as a result, even if it does not require, it will provide excess amount of this particular norepinephrine. So after the metabolism also, there's always norepinephrine left to attach and there's intensity of effect left to produce. So this is a very important scene in this cinema, which I saw, like we have all uh, maybe seen it in uh, this very interesting rather uh, Kabir Singh. So uh, there is a scene where I remember still that um, there after like after getting a hangover, this particular doctor, what he does is basically from uh, like when he wakes up in the morning, he takes cocaine. So after that, it's shown that he becomes normal. So, but there's huge amount of interaction. It's not one on one. So let's answer why this particular concept is wrong that after getting a hangover of alcohol, taking a cocaine will make you ready for a meeting in this particular morning. So the answer is basically because it acts on different receptors. So let's not dive into the alcohol mechanism of action, but you can understand that this is not a place where alcohol usually works. It is actually on different receptors and there are not all the effects of cocaine canceling that of alcohol. There are also something which can get initiated and they can be like, they can be positive in both. For example, if you take huge amount of alcohol and you can take a huge amount of cocaine together, what basically happens is that you will develop a huge drive of sympathetic nervous system because uh, initially what happens, alcohol actually acts as a sympathetic agent and that is why you get the blushing of your face. And that is why if you take it together, it can lead uh, you into developing huge amount of hypertensive emergencies. So you'll find patients presenting to you with huge amount of hypertensive emergency till the point basically there can be a particular congestive heart failure as well. So there, the basic idea behind it is because they're working on different receptors and all the factors are not canceling each other out. There are factors which even add together. And finally, the metabolism. So the metabolism is a very important thing. Like uh, vanilla and mandelic acid, VMA, as we all know, 
लाइक वी वर टॉट इन क्लास ट्वेल्थ ऑन ऑर्गेनिक केमिस्ट्री अबाउट दिस बट द एग्जैक्ट सीनारी ऑफ वी एम ए इज वेरी एविडेंट फ्रॉम द फार्माकोलॉजी सो वॉट बेसिकली वैलर एंड मैंडलिक एसिड इज रेस्पॉन्सिबल इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वेन यू डायग्नोज दिस फ्योक्रोमोसाइटोमा सो इन फ्योक्रोमोसाइटोमा देर इज ह्यूज अमाउंट ऑफ प्रोडक्शन ऑफ दिस नॉर एफ एन एफ थ्री एंड सो देर इज अ ह्यूज अमाउंट ऑफ प्रोडक्शन ऑफ द वी एम ए विच इज द मेटाबोलिक प्रोडक्ट सो दे आर टू इंपॉर्टेंट एनजाइम्स विच आर इन्वॉल्व आउट हियर वन इज द सीओ एम टी कैटेगोलाइन विच आर ट्रांसफेज एंड द माउ सो वी हैव टू ड्रग्स अगेन वी हैव Selegilin and we have entecapon. And entecapon is a very important drug that is used in Parkinson's. So this is basically what we have completed right now. I guess it's a bit more clear to you guys about what basically happens. So here we have the tyrosine that comes in, co coming in, and then it's coming co uh, converting into dopa, dopamine, and then it's thinking like I'll, I'll just relate it to a very uh, practical scenario. so for example uh, you're getting your um, pocket money maybe you're getting your pocket money you have a huge amount of pocket money and you think that let's collect it in a piggy bank and you decide to collect it in a piggy bank that is basically the vesicle but you think that uh, like let's also spend a little bit from like let's not put the entire thing into piggy bank and let's have a constant amount of release as well so that release is very important as i mentioned to you uh, in the case of sir but once you find that there is a huge uh, it's a great uh, video game that has been released into the market recently you basically break the piggy bank and you break the entire vesicle and this releases the nor adrenaline or your money into your hands and this is basically what is released into this synapse and once it's released into synapse it goes on and stimulates this is the point you play and so it stimulates the receptor and the body is that or you think that yeah i took 500 rupees and i have bought the video game in 400 let me take back 100 rupees and let me conserve it for future use so you take back 100 rupees and you can either store it back or you can basically spend it in another way or like spend it in another way meaning that you metabolize it so the thing like what happens is basically the noradrenaline can also get metabolized so the mao inhibitor will prevent its metabolism and thereby increase this particular concentration or non f and finally we come to the adrenergic receptors so this is the immunohistochemistry of the beta 2 adrenergic receptors so what are the types of adrenergic receptors what are they basically concerned about what is their role in the body will understand bit by bit but before hand like i want to like to discuss about this particular aspect about what exactly this is so this is basically the like how do we understand it is basically you have a particular chemical and you have a tagging element and once you tag this particular receptors there are particular parts because basically this is a gpcr so this is a g protein coupled receptor and it's located on the membrane and once you particularly have a fluorescent dye uh, along with it you actually can have the glow and this is what you have it so the adrenergic receptors or adrenal receptors are a class of g protein coupled receptors which are located on the cell membranes of the receptor tissue very evident from this diagram so we have different types of receptors we have the ones which is present inside the nucleus we have the ones which is present on the cell membrane So yes, adrenal receptors are present on the cell membrane, and here comes the division of the adrenergic receptors. So conventionally, you can find it divided into the alpha and beta form, and the way I have divided, like a uh, kept it as alpha, alpha one, alpha two, and beta, is basically because alpha two is quite different from alpha one, being the fact that alpha one is only present in the post synapse alpha 2 can be present both in the post and the pre synapse let's look at this, this diagram where you can see alpha 2 being present here so the alpha 2 like if it's uh, if you find any particular adrenal receptors in the pre synapse it's always going to be alpha 2 but when you find it in the post synapse it can be any form of alpha meaning that alpha 2 is a bit different 
from the rest of the two because it can be it is the main receptor that is taken like that is involved in the taking up of norepinephrine is present in the free synapse so these are various classifications of them we need not go right into it i myself have not like um, gone deep into it exactly where to a to b and to c are present but let's look at this particular receptor so we'll go for the alpha 1 adrenergic receptor and we'll understand what are the drugs that we deal with in common clinics so when we talk about the alpha 1 receptors uh, yeah alpha 1 receptors they mainly involve the smooth muscle contraction so the smooth muscle contraction can be present in various locations so it causes the vasoconstriction in many blood vessels it also causes the urate like it has a very important um, mechanism in both ureter and the uterus uh, there is a spelling mistake okay so uh, like in the gravid uterus like um, the final year is uh, has a subject obstetrics and gynecology where we study in the case of an obstructed liver we will have to give alpha 1 adrenergic um, agonists so that the uterine contraction can be done and the fetus can come out there is also the bronchiole so we'll understand that although the main major thing is about beta 2 receptor when it comes to bronchiole but it also has a basis out here and finally there is a blood vessels of the cilia body which is the reason for the mitriasis so the mitriasis of the pupil is regulated by this and then comes the alpha 2 so remember this very important point that it is both pre and post synaptic type this is like a very important concept that you must develop so when we talk about the alpha 2 adrenergic receptors it basically includes the following so it increases like it increases the glucagon decreases the insulin from the pancreas so uh, like um for like how do we relate it so for example uh, like um it will actually like when you increase the glucagon it will actually help like uh, also have the reciprocal action on insulin so that is why it's decreasing the insulin as well and the sphincters of gi tract is of course there and yeah and the increased platelet aggregation it's not very important as such but this was very important the pre synaptic inhibition or non epinephrine release in the cns and that is why it is a very important target for various um, psychiatric medicines and finally there is a decreases peripheral vascular resistance and finally we come to the beta adrenergic receptors so in the beta adrenergic receptors we have beta 1 beta 2 and also the beta 3 so you can see the beta 2 is involved in the bronchodilation beta 3 in the lipolysis beta 2 beta 3 in the vasodilation beta 2 in the glycogenolysis and also the gluconeogenesis so you can understand that the gluconeogenesis is very important specifically when you come to beta 2 because this is the factor that will help you to create a glucose amount in your body so when you get a fright or a flight stimuli for example when a particular person is scared of of his or her wits so you the first stimulus is maybe to like uh, provide a reflex or maybe to run away from that place so you need a, pro a proper maintenance of the glucose level in your body and so this is the receptor that is dealing with it and there is also the gi relaxation and this is the point which actually understand like makes us understand why when you are running like uh, you should not get into a marathon or you can you should not actually have a heavy meal before running a marathon this is because when you are running a marathon you have a huge amount of like adrenergic stimulation a sympathetic overdrive and so there is a relaxation and that's there that's why the food you had cannot be digested properly and then there is the increase in the heart rate the conduction velocity also increases and also very importantly automaticity of the idioventricular pacemakers so this increases the heartbeat and the one important the two important receptors concerned with this are beta 1 and beta 2 so let's understand the beta 2 in a very simple manner again so when we talk about the beta 2 what do you actually see that there is a bronchodilation 
so there is an increased amount of ventilation in your lungs so you're getting huge amount of air when you have the beta 2 st- drive like the beta 2 stimulation you have increased heartbeat as well and you have the increased amount of glucose as well so even if you like forget everything like just remember what happens when you are running so when you you are running you need a huge amount of intake of oxygen you need huge amount of bronchodilation and you need a increase in the heart rate as well as you need glucose and finally this is the recap so we had alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 2 and also beta 3 but we actually will stick this to this particular part so after this i have i guess about 10 minutes left okay so after this we'll go to the next part which is the sympathetomimetics so when we talk about the sympathetomimetics we basically understand this very important five drugs so mimetics basically means to copy or rather have these drugs have a sympathetic drive so when you inject this drug you basically get a sympathetic stimulation so of course we have adrenaline it's a very given fact adrenaline and noradrenaline are very important in this and here comes adrenaline so adrenaline is one of the very important drugs not only for the function of the cardiac for the function of anaphylactic shock but also for the local anesthesia yeah so the very important part which we would like to actually go forward is that the adrenaline is the alpha 1 2 beta 1 2 3 agonist alpha 1 2 and beta 1 2 3 agonist so basically when we find alpha 1 just remember in your mind that you're talking about smooth muscle contraction so very like basically you have uh, if you need to like cut down to very essential points you can mention that the alpha 1 has the smooth muscle contraction so the vasoconstriction is one of the very major role of this drug so why do we use it in anaphylactic shock the answer lies here so basically when you have anaphylactic shock there is increased amount of perfusion from your peripheral vessels so the permeability of your peripheral vessels increase and there is the increased amount of Uh, like there is the increased perfusion from your vessels causing the edema of course like for the edema we have very uh, a very basic idea about inflammation that the cause of edema is basically the fluid leaking out from the vessels to put it very simply so this is basically due to increased permeability of the vessels and if you basically have two structures so you have a very constricted structure and you have a loose structure which has huge amount of gaps in between so for example if you consider my fingers if you club them together there are co- uh, less holes but you if you relax it you have more holes and thus the chances of perfusion increases so when you actually have an inflammation there are increased number of permeability or the pore size increases but you when you are giving the adrenaline is basically closing them down and preventing the further leakage so in the adrenaline Uh, the one of the very important roles is basically the one is to one thousand concentration of adrenaline. So this is basically when, uh, when, uh, for example, if you find an anaphylaxis, um, like what we find in the clinics is basically of uh, very commonly two types of cases: one person taking amoxicillin or having a drip of amoxicillin. Supposedly, uh, he is suffering, he or she is suffering from a common sore throat, and a, a doctor gives amoxicillin without even testing. so this is very important for you guys as well for uh, because uh, like when i uh, got um, like to a dentist for um, a cavity uh, the a doctor actually gave me amox so i said that um, since i have added, like an allergy towards amoxicillin you might want to change this medicine so this is very important to keep in mind like for indian conditions i don't know about how much it's possible to test the sensitivity but you must at least ask the patient that if you have any predisposed allergies to any antibiotic and in that case try to add, uh, like uh, avoid um, the amoxicillin so 
in case you don't and in case is a worst case scenario the patient lies up uh, lands up in a anaphylactic shock scenario so there's huge amount of rapid falling blood uh, pressure as well and there is where you can give the adrenaline injection and there is also the local anesthesia so a local anesthesia is very important part for both mbbs and bds in the fact that local anesthesia has to be like constricted to a very particular systematic like not to spread out into the system but has to be constricted into a very local region so the local anesthesia is basically brought forward by constriction so there's a tube and you constrict both the ends of the tube so that the anesthetic agent remains in between the tube so that is the vasoconstriction so you need a vasoconstrictor and the adrenaline is one of the best vasoconstrictor that you can think about and then there is a noradrenal so it's the alpha 1 beta 1 alpha 1 2 and beta 1 agonist so it's a, a direct cardiac stimulant and also blood vessel constrictor so it is very important in the case of hypotension so like for example uh, if a particular patient uh, lands up in your uh, emergency having an anaphylactic shock uh, you will have hypotension as well but uh, you do not use noradrenaline so noradrenaline is more like you have postural hypotension so if you are like if you, uh, a particular patient comes to clinic saying that i'm uh, when, whenever i actually i rise up from a sitting posture i feel a bit giddy so this is the drug we give to them and so then there are the three drugs so the isoprenaline is the beta 1 to agonist the dopamine is the alpha 1 to beta 1 to 3 agonist and the salbutamol is very important for the bronchial asthma is the selective beta 2 agonist so let's dive right into this beta 2 again so that we can understand so beta 2 helps in the bronchodilation and once it is actually helpful in bronchodilation the bronchial asthma is actually the spasm of the muscle and so this helps in relieving the pain and the dopamine is also very important in the um, congestive cardiac failure and the isoprenaline for the cardiac arrests so like uh, to discuss each of them in details would be not possible because i guess i have 5 minutes left so like the next part is the adrenergic receptors the blockers the antagonists so when we talk about the antagonists we have two antagonists in mind we have the alpha and the beta blockers and the way we divide is is basically non selective selective and the uh, non selective blockers the selective alpha 1 and the selective alpha 2 and the beta blockers are the first second and the third generation so when we talk about the non selective alpha blockers we have irreversible type and the reversible type and here again comes the pheochromocyte so it is the type is phenoxybenzamine is a very important drug it covalently binds as compared to the reversible which is phentolamine which competitively binds so in this case it is a prominent venodilator and the, the uh, in the reversible case is also a venodilator more than vasodilator so the adversities out here is tachyarrhythmia angina and mi this is for phentolamine and phenoxybenzamine is a very important drug when it comes to pheochromocytoma so the first thing that comes into mind when you read about pheochromocytoma from now onwards should be phenoxybenzamine and then comes the selective alpha blockers so the selective alpha blockers are a very important topic and i guess uh, like uh, to like to cover selective alpha blockers as such would take huge amount of time but one of the very like the two important drugs one of them becoming tamsulosin is a selective alpha 1 blocker so it causes minimal or no tachycardia because it is selective and tamsulosin is one of the very important things that you want to keep in mind for the ureter part which we study so since the alpha 1 is present in the ureter part as well so there it is tamsulosin it is a uroselective uh, medication for treatment of benign prostatic hypertrophy and there is a prazosin as well which is a potent arterial dilator as compared to phenoxybenzamine which is a potent venous dilator and then comes yohimbin yohimbin is a very very interesting drug but it's not used as a particularly marketed drug it's an alkaloid and an experimental aphrodisiac so we are not very clear about how exactly this alpha 2 blocker activity is selective in yohimbin 
So basically, we do not have much idea, and this makes the drug more interesting. And finally, we come to the best part of this session, which is the beta adrenergic blockers. So we have the division as first generation, second generation, third generation. In spite of being first, second, third, we should rather remember it as the basically what it does. So, for example, in the non-selective beta blockers, we have drugs like the first generation beta blockers are the non-selective ones. So we have drugs like propranolol, timolol, sotalol, nodalol, levobinolol, and pindolol. So all the beta adrenergic blockers, remember this fact, are the lols of the pharma family. So all the drugs began, began uh, like end with lols. So propranolol is a very important drug. As we study in final year, we come across it very many times in cardiovascular system. It's used to treat hypertension. It's uh, useful for arrhythmia, thyrotoxicosis, and also essential tremors, and also prevent migraine headache. So I'll just give a very quick description about how it does actually uh, prevent the migraine headache. Uh, and then also it's used for angina and previous heart attacks. So basically when we find about migraine, we will study uh, various migraine drugs as well. But one thing that is very uh, much missed by students when we talk about migraine headache is that initially there is vasoconstriction and then there is the vasodilation. So this vasoconstriction and vasodilation is the phase like when you basically examine the patient of migraine in your clinic, the vasoconstriction phase is almost never felt. It's almost gone for every time. It's basically the vasodilation phase that you feel. And that is why it's uh, propranol is used for the migraine headaches because uh, there is increased amount of blood flow to your carotid in your brains and that uh, to your brain and that is why there is the presence of aura and, and other symptoms of migraine. So the intracranial pressure tension are some other topics we can discuss later maybe. And then there is this uh, second generation beta blocker. So here we found non-selective and here we found selective. So these are the selective beta one blocker. So do not think it as third generation, for example, third generation antibiotics. It's not like that, that the third generation are almost always more potent and almost always more suitable because we use propranolol nowadays in clinics as well with huge amount of efficacy. So the first, in some cases, you might see that the first generation drugs are better than the third generation beta drugs. So there's no uh, relation to the use in the current clinics, but it's rather like this. Uh, that the action. So the selective beta one blockers are basically what we call the second generation beta blockers, and they are drugs like metoprolol, esmolol, atenolol, pisoprolol, and esmolol. So if we discuss two very important drugs, the metoprolol. It's a it's used in a number of uh, conditions: hypertension, angina, acute AMI, uh, uh, congestive heart failure, and prevention of migraine again. So you can understand this prevention of migraine is a very important topic out here. Um, that is basically because of this beta blocking activity. So uh, this is one of the very important points you can keep in mind and the mechanism which I can uh, like uh, I told you just a few minutes ago. And the esmolol, which you will find in market as the name previ block, is a cardio selective beta one receptor block. So it is very rapid onset and a very short duration of action. And it is also an arrhythmic, anti-arrhythmic. So uh, like anti-arrhythmia is one of the very major most topic that you want to cover when you study the cardiovascular system. I hope that you will study Ismolol in quite details out there as well. But for the time being, when you talk about the beta blockers, the Ismolol is basically a short duration and a class two anti-arrhythmic. And then we finally come to the third generation beta blockers, and we have uh, like the non-selective and the selective as well. And so the uh, non-selective ones are labetalol, carbidolol, and then there are the selective, which are the betaxolol, caliprolol, and nevibilol. So these drugs are not very important as we talk about it. Like we do not find uh, for even your exams, you won't find short notes, and even while you're practicing in clinics. It's not very important as such, but uh, very important to focus upon. Like uh, I just mentioned, the topics that you want to 
focus upon before I end this session is the part on adrenaline, is the part on the beta blocker itself. So the synthetic myometics, the beta adrenergic blockers, the third generation is not that important. I guess I got a question about first generation, about the first generation beta blockers in my fiber in the second year. But otherwise, there is the noradrenaline. And uh, I guess I was a little bit clear about the exact location of the receptors. The adrenoceptors are one point which are very important if you want to do research on them. So it's not very important from the viewpoint of your exams, but it's a very interesting topic. And this is a very important diagram. So you want to, like, I'll also share the slides uh, with Swastik, and he can share you, uh, them to you on um, the platforms as well. But this is a diagram that you should always keep in mind if you want to remember the pharmacology. So let's not root the drugs, but actually understand which drug acts where and how it works. And we have the metabolism. Metabolism will be specifically important if you study conditions like pheochromocytoma. So maybe glomus tumor is something you will study as well. So in that case, you will also get to understand a bit. Otherwise, it's not very important for the second years. As compared to the other parts, like these, um, like the mechanism of action of resipine, mechanism of action of beta tyrosine, and the mechanism of action of um, cocaine is important. Uh, yeah, the tricyclic antidepressants are very important. And finally, then we also had discussed about this general concept. So these general concepts, I guess, has been covered in your anatomy. And it's a pretty much difficult to understand, especially these four parts, like what are the divisions of the nerves that we come across. I guess I was a little bit clear about it. And I guess that's it. And before I end the session, I would also like to share something with you. One sec. Yeah. So, the primary intent of studying in the second year is a very difficult, was very difficult for me personally because I couldn't understand exactly what amount of doubts, like what are the doubts. So I always was in a fix whether my doubt was genuine or not. So you, the first step of understanding before you ask a doubt is that you need to understand the concept first. You need to study the concept clearly first and let yourself answer the questions first. So the best teacher to you is you yourself. And then there's Feynman who said, I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. So then question yourself, ask yourself question. Do not believe what is written in the book initially. So ask yourself, why is this happening? Why is cocaine working like this? Why is it even producing a sympathetic drive? Why am I calling adrenergic system to be a part of the sympathetic system? Question yourself first, discover new questions, and get them answered. So you can get them answered by the faculties you have. They are, of course, your greatest um, companions in your course to success. And I would like to also uh, entertain doubts which you have encountered through the session, not only like um, like from the viewpoint, like I would ask everybody to go through the slides again once read the topic tonight only. So do not postpone it. Try to complete even if you can, like if you're in the second year, it's very necessary to cover this topic. Try to cover this topic, maybe a fast read, go through the slides once, go through your book, go through your notes maybe, and then whatever your doubts you have, you can mail me at this particular mail. So you can uh, note down the mail. And uh, that concludes the session, I guess, yeah. And I think I've taken a little bit time. Thank you, Sriyanda, for such a wonderful presentation. Yeah, it was requested by some of our one of our to, um, viewers to just um, send the screen uh, presentation to him. So, yeah, yeah, and I've already dropped the. Um,
Okay, and yeah. I dropped it, and I've said drop the email ID in the uh, chat box. So people, if you have any queries, please uh po- please send them to the uh, to the mail ID. Yeah. And so Shijana, like once again, it's been an honor. So listen to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So like uh, before, like uh, understanding one thing, I would like to mention that uh, while I was in my second year. i couldn't um, actually understand whether my questions are genuine or not so that is the point of sharing the email id so that you can understand you can go through the topic again you can try to answer your questions and in case you find any difficulty with the slides or the concepts you can always mail sure thank you all your presence was important and once again a big thanks to shijanda for for clarifying a lot of concepts a lot of loopholes which needed to be rectified thank you once again shijanda welcome yeah Ah, uh, correct. Abar. Okay.